Good afternoon. Welcome back to another edition of the BNH Virtual Event Space. Today, we are talking about taking a personal project from inspiration to realization to publication with photographer Chris Sorensen. Chris, welcome. Glad to be here. Thank you very much. It's good to have you back. And as I was just telling Chris in the virtual green room before we went live, this is a project that he's talking about today that I've been following over the pandemic. Probably my favorite pandemic project that I had seen pop up was just incredibly creative and original and well executed as everything Chris does. So I'm super excited. So I'm going to get out of the way. So Chris, huge fan of your work. As I know many of our viewers are, I will invite them all to get their questions in. Um, Chris will be taking your questions throughout. So if you do have a question, don't wait until the end to ask it. Uh, but Chris, I'm going to kick it over to you, man. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to talk about this topic. Um, basically, my career is based on personal projects and I'm most proud of the most recent personal project, Wife During Quarantine. And I learned about a lot about myself, about photography, about creativity during the course of making it, and learned a lot about making a book, which we ended up doing. Um, and hopefully some of you guys will find, and girls will find that uh, informative and useful as well. Um, and as Derek said, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of questions and having to be interactive. And obviously this is virtual and there will be a Q&A at the end, but obviously sometimes it's hard to, you know, kind of bring back that energy when we're talking about an image, uh, you know, at the, you know, six o'clock when we're talking about it now and find it and everything. So if you have a question about anything or um, regarding an image or its creation, feel free to get in the chat and let Derek know and he can let me know and we can talk about it in the moment so that uh, it doesn't just sit there. So let me start here sharing the screen. Stop looking at me and start looking at a presentation. So, as I said, my whole career is basically dependent on personal projects. Um, a little bit about me, just so you know where we're coming from and where I am now. I do mainly celebrity and editorial portraiture. You know, everything from Nick Jonas for the cover of American Way, Samin Nazrat for a cover of Money, John Langozamo for Nexus Magazine. I've actually shot John uh, twice, once uh, another time for Observer Magazine. And then not only when you're shooting editorial portraiture, you're not just shooting celebrities, you're shooting regular people who have done something of note. Um, so this is Drew Dixon for the cover of Harvard Business School Alumni Magazine. Jonathan Silverstein for another alumni magazine. And I, and I love what I do. I, I love editorial photography because what it allows me to do is go and meet someone who has done something interesting and of note such that there's an article or a feature about them, get to know them a little better and try to make something creative and artistic that reflects them and what they do. Um, so that's, that's why I love my job. But I don't just do celebrity and editorial portraiture. I also do a lot of travel work as well. Covers of Hemispheres Magazine, Chile for Rhapsody Magazine, Nova Scotia for Hemispheres, Hong Kong and Shanghai, California Soul for Hong Kong Magazine, a New York Story for European Magazine. And I also do a fair amount of documentary work. This is for Washington Post Magazine on uh, brain, CTE and football injuries and brain disease. The story of a mob hitman who has reformed once he got out of prison for attempted murder and started a dog shelter. Behind the scenes of My Fair Lady on Broadway. And then NGO work in Cambodia with Empowering Youth in Cambodia and in Nepal for a uh, child welfare scheme. Now, the, the reason I bring, even though we're mostly going to talk about uh, portraiture here today, the reason I bring up the other areas is something that's kind of important that I always bring up when I'm doing talks, which is that you don't have to shoot just one thing. I mean, I've been at, as a photographer, and as even when I was learning and just getting into the industry, talks from people and they say, oh, you need to focus on, you know, portraiture, or you need to focus on this, otherwise, you know, you're not going to be successful because, there's so much competition, you really need to focus. 
or even if you focus, you have to shoot it just one way. I mean, there's a lot of very successful photographers who do, let's say, for example, portraiture, and they shoot it with the same style on everything. And I'm not, none of what I'm saying today is to like disagree with how other people do this business. I'm just talking about what works for me. And the reason I bring this up is like, I love shooting a variety of things. Even though portraiture is probably my first love and what I do most of, I love shooting the travel. I love shooting the documentary and I don't want to give it up. And one thing I like to start with is if you like shooting multiple things, you don't have to give up that to focus on one to be a successful photographer. You can do a variety of things. I always say, shoot what you love and the rest will follow. Um, so in addition to, you know, that kind of introduction of shooting a variety of things, I also got into photography in a very unique way. Photography isn't my first career. It isn't my second career. It's actually my third career. I got my first camera when I was 40 years old. And the, the way I got to that was kind of a jumble, but ultimately very, I'm very thankful it worked out this way. I, I was an English major in college. I always wanted to write. I always had an artistic side, but I had grown up extremely poor and didn't want to be the poor starving writer. So I got a business second degree. And when I graduated, I got a, a job in finance and said, I will write on the side. And when I have enough money saved up to quit and write, I will do that. And I was thankful I did okay in finance and was able, to, you know, in 2001 to quit and move to New York to go to NYU for the screenwriting program. And do, in the course of doing that, I took an acting class to help my writing, to know how to actors thought. And at one point, my acting teacher said, you know what, I'm not going to teach you anymore unless you get headshots, which was actually my first exposure to professional photography since my senior pictures in high school. Um, so I went and got headshots and I started auditioning. And for some reason, I started booking things, you know, a whole bunch of commercials, law and order, things like that. And in New York, a lot of the people who end up doing, you know, commercials and stuff also end up doing print jobs, modeling, for lack of a better word, because the same people they're hiring to shoot a Citibank commercial are, are the people they're going to hire for the Citibank ads. So I started going, you know, getting jobs on, you know, in front of the camera and on breaks and stuff, instead of like dealing with or hanging with the other models, I'd be hanging with the photographers because it was like, you know, the old creative aspect of, you know, wanting to be a writer and tell stories, you know, the photography was interesting in that, but it also, in addition to having the creative side, had the technical side. It kind of tickled both of my brains. So finally, after doing it, uh, the, you know, the commercials and the print modeling for a while, I, I bought a camera and started shooting my model and actor friends. Um, and that's at, at age 40, and they started using them, and their agents started reaching out to me, and, you know, it, in my early 40s, suddenly I had a kind of a side gig or hobby as a, you know, as a photographer. And what was I shooting at that point? Um, no, let's talk about this. The reason I bring all this up <laughs> before I get into where I started from is that, you know, and I, like I said, I'm dealing with things I've heard and talking with people and going to other things, you know, you don't have to assist. You don't have to go to school of photography. You don't have to, you know, know what you're going to do right away. And you don't have to be successful young. You can literally start photography at any time. Like I said, I bought my first camera at 40. And you don't have to, as I'm about to show you, start, stick with one type of photography. When I started, like I said, I was shooting headshots and model tests because that's what I knew. So here's some of the, from, you know, 2007 and eight to nine, some of the headshots. And then I started shooting, you know, some lifestyle model tests for, you know, for people to put in their cards and in their portfolios. And then beauty shots for the same thing for models, you know. So that's where I started. That was my introduction to photography. So how did I get from there to where I am now where, you know, like the cover of American Way with Nick Jonas? And the answer is, as you probably can guess, personal projects. Um, I'm a huge fan, like I said, and, and why am I a fan? Because they do so many things for you as a photographer. I mean, first of all, they fulfill your creativity because even if you're working a lot on paid jobs, it doesn't guarantee that you're working on the things that you want to work on. So personal projects allow you to work on what you care about. It allows you to fill your time because once again, you're not always working on paid jobs as often as you'd want. 
it gives you the opportunity to generate new work because you know in today's social media world you need new work to be posting on instagram to be sending to editors to show that you're out there doing things and out there doing things gives you the opportunity to develop um, and practice new skills to become a better photographer to learn a new type of work um, and by doing all this and you know submitting it to editors and to you know going to portfolio reviews etc this work can help you build your client list and get more work. And the other reason to do personal projects is sometimes you just have to. I mean, there's a project that deep in your heart that means something to you and you're like, I, I need to document this. And so that's a very important. And we're going to talk later today with, with wife or this evening with uh, wife during quarantine about one of those projects. And another way, reason why personal projects, which you don't often hear, is your clients expect you to shoot it. Um, Every time I go to a portfolio review, every time I meet with an editor, one of the questions they invariably ask is, what have you been shooting for yourself? They, you know, everybody goes in for, and let's say you're meeting with somebody who does lifestyle and they all have great lifestyle work. Or if you're doing editorial portraiture and you meet with an editor, they all have, you know, great editorial work. What differentiates you in the, you know, in marketing yourself to these editors is what you really care about. Not the stuff that you do on assignment, the stuff that, you know, you go out and seek and create on your own. And editors want to see that because they want to know what inspires you. Um, so, like I said, big fan of personal projects. And the one reason I am, and I always say there's one person, no matter what, I know will hire me, and that's me. So I do personal projects as a way of basically investing in myself, of hiring myself. Now, when you do this, you know, when you're working possible personal projects and, and not on assignments, there's always people who are going to try to take advantage of that. Um, who say, you know, can you do this or what? And sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. But my guidelines on that are pretty simple. I, I never work for free. I work for me. <laughs> but sometimes working for me means it's no charge. But that doesn't mean it's free because I'm not agreeing to do something unless I'm getting something out of it that makes it justifiable for me. So, what can be personal projects? Because a lot of times you think, oh my God, a personal project has got to be this huge, you know, years long or month long, a huge heartfelt project. And that's not the case. I mean, yes, that is obviously a big part of some personal projects, but it doesn't have to be. Shooting events, you know, and I'm going to show some things later on can be a personal project. A social cultural movement can be a personal project. Just a personal assignment, like I, I, I want to do an editorial portrait, I should go assign myself an editorial portrait. A certain topic, um, and then, like I said, they don't need to be a certain time frame. They can be long term, or they can be one offs or one day. So, I guess my, when it comes to personal projects, my cutting to the quick of it is: don't be afraid to start them because anything can be a good personal project. But at the same time, don't be afraid to stop them because don't be afraid just because you got into a um, project that you have to continue it. There's been projects, and I've done a ton of them that I love, but there's some that I've started and it's like, you know what, I am not getting out of this what I thought it was. I'm not enjoying it or I'm not getting the skill set development out of it or whatever. And I've stopped it. So the other the thing to remember is, hey, go there and try it. But if it's not working out, you're not, you feel free to let it go. So some of the personal projects I've done just very quickly, like Fulton Street was my first personal project. And it was a documentation of a gentrifying neighborhood and the people getting pushed out of it. So this was kind of like one of those heartfelt projects and also it was kind of a long-term project. I've also done just, hey, I need to develop a certain skill set and I'm going to do, uh, you know, um, something to, to be able to develop that skill set and have work to show editors that shows that I can do this. So I gave myself editorial portrait assignment where I, I went and asked friends, I'm, like, I'm going to come shoot you. I'll only be there for an hour and basically self-assigned like magazine work. And then I've done, you know, NGO work or document documentary work. And this was I aid to give back and also make a difference, but also to develop the skill set and the portfolio so that I could market myself as being able to go out and do this to get more work. And then I do a lot of what I call like cultural and colorful events. Westminster Dog Show, Comic-Con, 
And I love these because they're, they're I love creative communities because they're, they're people are willing and excited to be photographed. Um, they're interesting things to photograph. Bushwick, the drag festival. And one of the things I, I do is like, I often will shoot things multiple times and I always try to shoot it differently. So like this time I'm shooting it handheld flash, documentary style. The next time I shot it, I brought a backdrop and just shooting like for traditional portraits. The third time I shot it, I brought gels and, you know, and I, different lighting and much, much more complicated, sophisticated lighting. Because once again, I'm trying to develop my skill set and have work to show to people so I can get work like this from, you know, paid work. And I've done the same thing with the Mermaid Parade, you know, shooting it one year with documentary style, another year with a backdrop. And then a third year with a different backdrop and a different kind of lighting. People often ask like, okay, so for these kind of things, how do you get access? And for a lot of these, I'm just choosing events that are open to the public, Westminster, you know, all of these are just things you can get in or you can get a press pass. And if you have like a stock agency or any kind of thing like that, or if you have a relationship with a magazine, you can request to have them get you help get you a press pass. Or you can just write them, email them and say, hey, I'm doing this project. I'd love to shoot it. Can you get me a press pass or access? So all of these things basically help me grow from, hey, Mr. Headshot and modeling 10 years ago to doing, you know, to being a working successful uh, editorial photographer. Well, at least I was working until COVID. <laughs> COVID hit and everything ended. Within a week, you know, March 13th of 2020, when New York City shot, shut down, within a week, all of my assignments had been postponed or canceled indefinitely. So suddenly I wasn't able to shoot anything. Um, so the only person, and, and, and I'm a, obviously I'm a big fan of personal projects, but I couldn't even like, besides assignments, there was nothing I could do. You could barely leave the house at that time in New York City. You couldn't interact with other people. So I had nobody to shoot. Then actually I realized I did have somebody to shoot and that was my wife and we started this project. Um, and I'm just gonna play here because some of you may not be familiar with it, just a very quick video um, of the project in the order we sh uh, shot them. So we shot 67 images over the year and a little less than a year and a half uh, of the pandemic. And one of the things we tried to do is always make something different. So you'll, you'll see that everything is pretty much different lighting, different character, different setting. Um, because basically I wanted to use this as an opportunity, you know, going back to what are the, the uses of a personal project to develop my skill set, to try things new that I can't do in the span of a, you know, quick editorial shoot. If I have 10 minutes with, let's say, Jane Goodall, I can't and I have to get two looks or three looks for the magazine, I have very little time to be super risky and creative. So sometimes you're very restricted in how crazy or interesting you can be. I mean, I, you know, I'm proud of the work I do, but sometimes you can't be as creative as you'd like. So I saw this project as a way to, to, to do that. And that creativity is a big thing of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, you know. We work in a creative industry, but so often when you hear talks about photography, it's all about the technical, you know, and we're going to talk about the technical. We're going to talk about lighting and props and setting up and all that kind of stuff. But I'm also going to talk a lot about how I came up with the idea and then how I basically, you know, translated the, the idea to actually an image because a lot, you know, an image that's just in your head doesn't do you any good. You got to find a way to get it out of the head and onto the, you know, onto the, I would say film, but here, you know, memory card. So a lot of people and me included kind of fall into the uh, stereotype, you know, that creativity is this flash of inspiration, this bolt of lightning, you know, like, boom, you have this idea and that's it. Well, unfortunately for me, at least that's not how it works. I mean, every once in a while I have an image come to me and it's just like fully formed in my head but that's extremely rare. Um, most of the time for me, an idea is a starting point. You know, it's a roadmap towards a destination and I have to find where I'm going and how to get there. Um, so for me, that, that process is solving a problem. So I'll have an idea and I gotta like basically, pro you know, figure out what's the next step. How do I get to the, from A to B to C to final image? Um, 
And so one of the things I kind of, through the course of the pandemic and kind of evaluating my work was thinking of building an image or an idea in layers. And which is my way of basically translating this kind of amorphous idea that's in my head to a final image. So there's the image basics that you have, you know, you got to get right, you know, for a good portrait, you know, you got to get the pose, the expression, the setting, the lighting, the props, you, you got to get the basics right. But there's a lot of photographers who can do this. So this is an image of mine I shot in 2019 before the pandemic of John C. Riley, And I love this image and the client loved it. But this was the image that, you know, I was already starting before the pandemic to kind of evaluate my work and figure out how can I elevate myself? Because I'm at a certain level and let's say I want to go to the next level. What, what can make my work better? And I, as much as I love this image, a lot of people could have made this image. Um, it's a good image, but you know, there's nothing that's special the same says Chris Sorensen made this image or whatever. So I wanted to kind of start thinking about what are those things that I need to start thinking about to, to make a difference, to make an image that stands out um, even more. So one of the things I kind of came up to is, you know, adding these layers to kind of increase complexity and, and, and you know, successfulness of an image. And one of the things I came up with, and this is just a stupid, these are things I kind of came up with through the pandemic, and I kind of came up with a stupid um, acronym just to help me remind it, which is SCAMPS. And um, that means nothing other than the fact that it helps me remember the components, which are shapes, colors, angles, movement, parts, and shadows. Basically, all of the non lighting and posing, you know, I listed those basics. These are things beyond that that I can use to help add complexity and sophistication and, and you know, hopefully you know, interest to an image. So just to give some examples, shapes. So this is an image, and these are gonna be images from wife during quarantine. So shapes, this is an image I made and basically, you know, using the black on black and the, the chair that kind of looks like a skeleton, you know, it was a way of creating something abstract and graphic out of, you know, just a woman sitting in a chair. You know, we did this kind of dollhouse image. And once again, just wanting to make, you know, simplify, make things graphic. That's basically what for color uh, or shapes to me means making things graphic. Um, our, our handmade, once again, something very graphic and, you know, simple and, you know, very, you know, very basic colors. Colors, once again, going from that to colors, for me, can mean everything from something that's all about the colors, like this image here, where you know we're obviously dealing with a lot of gels, to this, where you're 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 using color in a way where it's monochromatic, but monochromatic in a color way. Um, so it's not black and white; it's orange and or orange and black. You know, you know, monochromatic in in a colorful way. Or it can also mean the lack of color. So an, an effectively black and white image other than a little bit of skin and the, and the red hair. So, so those three ways of looking at color. Angles, it's another way of, I always try to kind of evaluate. And that is, you know, you know, shooting up, shooting at angles. So this was kind of supposed to be like a horror movie, a, you know, pulp novel kind of cover. So it made sense to be kind of, you know, shooting below this kind of filmic look. And now when I say angles, I'm not only talking about angle of where my camera is, I'm also talking angle of view, which can be the lens choice basically. So this, you know, it's a very up close um, portrait, but I'm shooting at 28 millimeters. So that's the other thing, you know, you wouldn't normally shoot, you know, a portrait at 28, but here for this effect, you know, it adds to it. So to, I am always trying to think not only what angle I should be shooting from, but what angle and or focal length um, I should be uh, shooting with because that'll have an effect on the impact of the image. Um, and sometimes it's both. So on this one, I'm shooting at 24 millimeters and I'm right on the floor, right in front of her, which elongates her. It kind of distorts her body. Her feet are obviously larger. Her head kind of gets smaller. Um, so this one incorporates both, both the angle of view and the angle of the lens. And then the other thing I've always trying to evaluate whether I want to include is movement. And when I mean that is both movement of my subject, like here I shot on the slow shutter speed and I had her spin around with, you know, there's a flash to freezer and then there's LEDs to light the spin. 
but not just movement of the subject, but also movement of camera. So this was shot with stroboscopic mode um, and with a stroboscopic move is basically mode is when the flash fires multiple times within the, the, sh the shutter speed and I'm moving the camera parallel to the ground as I shoot and the flash illuminates the face and then the rest of it is lit by LEDs. Um, and then parts, I'm always evaluating how little I need to show to tell the story of an image. Because I think a lot of times I, you know, I used to shoot too wide, um, and I think sometimes the more you, the tighter you get, the less you show, the more interesting an image can be. So I'm always thinking, all right, do, am I showing too much? Can I tell the same story in a stronger way with showing less? Here's another example of that. Another here, you know, I, I, I don't need to see any more of this. In fact, it would distract from just the hair, the flower, and the eyes if I showed more than that. And finally, shadows, using shadows to, you know, heighten the interest in an image from here, you know, here to kind of give more of a horror movie and effect, given the kind of Sweeney Todd vibe here to, you know, kind of have a different shadow than the person. But I'm also not even thinking just shadows like that you see, but also what is in shadow. So here she's in basically silhouette with a light behind her and atmosphere aerosol in the air. And you can just barely see it. So you, I'm always interested in, once again, kind of going back to the parts, how little do I need to show of an image to tell the story? Or can I tell a better story by showing less? And here, putting her in silhouette told the story better. This is when we got our second vaccination. And you can see that there's she's in silhouette, and the only thing lit from the front is the band-aid from where she got her shot. And this is the same story. This was, you know, during the course of you know a year and a half and 67 <laughs> images. Sometimes it's just a holiday that motivates the uh, the genesis of a picture. And this was for Valentine's Day. So we cut out a, a red heart and you know, I blew out the background, put her basically in silhouette, threw a, a red gelled light on the heart. And, you know, by, you know, putting her in shadow and telling less of the story, so to speak, it makes a more graphic and interesting image. So that's a very quick and dirty summary of, you know, kind of the things I'm looking at when I'm trying to come up with an idea and manifest an idea to actually create the image. So let's kind of start, uh, talking about, you know, what I was hoping to gain from life during quarantine. You know, I, I, for me, the progress as a photographer has been, you know, you learn to take a picture and then you learn to make a picture. And then my goal with this was to learn or to figure out how to make art, to make, you know, not just a, a portrait, but to make something that I would consider art. Um, and kind of along those same lines, you know, what I, in, in different levels and layers of sophistication, there, you know, I wanted to go from creating an image to on some creating the character, and then from you know to kind of the final, not just a character, but in this in the image, telling a story with that. Um, and this was an interesting project for me because you know, being an editorial photographer, um, the uh, this is the first time I was completing the images 100% co constructing them as opposed to going on an assignment where you're dealing with a certain location, the requirements from the um, the magazine, et cetera. So this was the very first image of the project and I am flying on time. So we're gonna not have a problem with that. Um, and so like I said, this started in, with COVID and I sat there for six weeks not knowing what to do besides sit on my couch and doom scroll. I had lost all my assignments. I couldn't do what I thought, you know, were my normal personal projects. Um, so I didn't know what to do. And then one day I saw my wife wearing this green shirt and I noticed that it matched the peacock feathers we had as a decoration. I thought, oh, I have a green backdrop. There's an image there. Um, and so I asked if she had 10 minutes, you know, between Zoom calls and she did. And that morning when she did her hair, we knew we were going to shoot this. So she kind of did it in a way that would work for this project. We figured out some basic jewelry that kind of supported that. And we shot this. And suddenly, you know, it was like, ah, you know, I, I, I do have somebody I can shoot. I do have something I can do. And so two days late, well, going back to this, you can see that this 
is still somewhat a very similar image to this, that same concept. Two days later, we made this, which again, kind of using the color coordination and it's a good portrait, but once again, nothing special, um, nothing that I wanted to accomplish. This was the third um, image in Wife During Quarantine. This is when I started to basically experiment. This was basically slow shutter speed, um, no flash at all, wanting to intentionally get blur to create something painterly. Um, and then this was the fourth image. And this kind of tells you just how the, the mental process of creativity for me worked. So, you know, this was, you know, seven weeks into the pandemic. My wife ordered this mask. She tried it on. I'm like, oh, that's kind of a cool mask. And then I'm like, okay, well, we should, it's a pandemic. We're doing this project. We should shoot this. So, and then I'm like, okay, now problem solving. How do I solve to make this mask into a cool image? Well, the image is, or the mask is black. So I'm thinking, okay, I know my wife's going to have some black and white stuff. So we, let's, let's try to maybe do a monochromatic work where the only color is her hair. So I asked my wife, okay, what kind of black and white suits do you have? So she had amazingly this checked suit. So I'm like, okay, so now how do we build on that? So we have the suit, we have the mask. Ah, we have these leather gloves. Okay, so suddenly that. So what, what would make leather gloves? Oh, you know, maybe kind of a Bond villain. Well, I have this hat from a Halloween costume. So suddenly this mask and then just kind of problem solving, what can I add to it to create something? We ended up with this kind of Bond villain kind of quasi thief look. And then the next question is how am I going to light it? And you know, obviously the white background was an easy decision because I wanted it to be as stark as possible. And the hard light and shadow was chosen because, hey, I'm dealing with you know, like this Bond villain this shadowy kind of character. So let's actually put a shadow in the image. Um, and it kind of dresses it up because instead of just being on a white background, suddenly the backdrop has a little bit of interest in it as well. This was the 10th image uh, in this. And this is gonna just kind of talk about how I basically go from just kind of words in my head to an image. So my whole thought on this was a clean Pollock. Like what if Pollock was painting, you know, one of his, you know, paintings, but he was absolutely pristine. So then how would that look? So the first thing is like, okay, what can I do? Okay, we, I can buy paint, I can make a backdrop. So this is all of this is just um, Crayola child's paint on white seamless that the night before I had just sprayed on the backdrop. Um, and then let flat to dry. Um, and then I'm I'm thinking all this is thought up in advance though, because we because I'm doing this for the most part in advance because I'm trying to like add these layers. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna need paintbrushes because I want her to have paintbrushes in the hand, but not I don't just need paintbrushes. I want to like keep adding little pieces. So I also thinking, okay, so I'm gonna want my her hair to be up because I don't want it to be down and distract from the silhouette because I want you know, the white shirt to be clean against the backdrop. So I want that up. So if I'm going to have it up, you know, my wife often will have like, you know, a pick or something in her hair when she has it up. So I'm like, ah, I should buy some little skinny paintbrushes because then my wife can use those. And that just adds another little touch that a lot of people won't notice. But if they do, it's like, oh, that's an interesting little addition to it. Um, so then, the, you know, it was just basically getting her set up, I put, you know, we put it on the table, painting her, keeping her clean. And then, you know, everything was like, once again, thought through. So like the brush, the brushes in her hair have contrasting colors to the brushes in her hands. Um, and then once again, trying to just get that thing, that extra little oomph, you know, I had her standing or sitting there doing, you know, kind of regular poses, but then I was like, okay, do bug eyes. And that was what made the image because it becomes much more interesting with that a little emotional spark. Um, this is a uh, another image in, called movie night. Once again, this is completely motivated by the pandemic. Obviously, you know, movies and sitting at home, people were like going nuts. And so we wanted to kind of reflect that kind of deal. So I had in my head like, all right, I wanted to do something environmental because we had done and did so many kind of studio or on backdrop shots. What do we have? Well, we have a living room. What can I do in the living room? Well, okay, 
I can have her watching TV, doing movies. And then once I had that movie night, okay, let's build on that. Okay, so what does that look like? All right, so let's just do as extreme as possible. You know, the, 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 the person in the robe, the person in slippers, the curlers in the hair, the mask on the face, the, you know, so we ordered the, the robe and the curlers, those giant curlers from Amazon. Um, and then basically that was the concept. And then I, so I had it pretty well set up in my head at that point, once we ordered everything. The one thing I didn't have in my head is we added in sight the, the wine bottle. I sat it and it was just kind of an empty spot. And I'm like, you know what? adding the wine bottle, which seems insignificant, but it actually adds a lot to the image because it kind of tells you a little bit about this person. You know, she's got the giant wine glass, the giant bowl of popcorn, and she's got the, she's, you know, she doesn't have a wine glass in the um, kitchen. She's got it right there ready to pour for more. So it helps, you know, like I said, take a story or take an image from, you know, just an image to a character to telling the story and the wine bottle helps tell the story. Um, and this is how it was lit. Um, in the right-hand side over here, you have the fill light, um, which is gel blue and low, so it doesn't reflect in the window. You have the gridded softbox in the middle of the picture, which is gel green. Because one thing, you know, when you're watching with um, TV, you know, there's multiple colors going. So well, I wanted it to have that feeling of multiple colors going, um, but I also wanted to have some clean light on her. So behind the softbox, you have a, a snooted light that illuminates um, basically um, her feet, the popcorn bottle, and her face. So the blue night kind of feel and kind of TV glow comes from the fill light with the blue gel, the kind of mix in, in the kind of around the couch and on her and the feet and everything, the kind of greenish there and on the end table comes from the, the gelled softbox and then the kind of white light on her comes from the um, the snooted light. And everything obviously has to be properly set because everything else has to expose correctly to the lamp on the left. That I, I knew I wanted the, uh, a practical light in there to kind of set the scene. And so I had to expose and set everything else so that that light was where I wanted it. So that was the first light and everything else got built up from there. This light, so, um, or the image that was, you know, used by B&H for marketing this, is actually an, an idea I've had a long time um, and never did. And, you know, so many of the images, almost all of the images basically came from ideas I had during the course of the pandemic. This is the one that came from something before. And just to mention, I keep an idea, like in my notes folder on my, on my phone, I have an idea in a folder where I'm always you know, writing down little ideas that as I come up and now, and I always go through that to try to see like, okay, what can I add here? And in Instagram, I have, you know, some people, I've, I've heard some people say they don't like to look at other people's images. They'd like to just work on their own. I love to look at images. And I probably that comes from me being self-taught because um, I, I, I learned from seeing work and deconstructing and figuring out how they did it. So I like to look at images and they motivate me and they give me ideas. I'll take lighting from here, pose from here, you know, and kind of combine and mash it up into my own little thing. Um, but this idea I've had for a long time, which was, you know, a blindfolded person reading a censored newspaper. And when I first had it, my idea was to do it environmentally. But I had already shot this there, and I didn't want to, like I said, I didn't want to do any re repetition or anything. So I didn't want to have to, you know, repeat or have the same thing. So I said, okay, we're not gonna do it environmentally. We're gonna do it on a backdrop. And I thought, well, maybe I do it on a black backdrop eh, and there were a white backdrop. But then I decided that the newspaper made it more interesting because doing it on a black and white, A, because we had other images like that, but it also helps tell the story of this image, which is, you know, this person is drowning in a sea of news, but is oblivious to it or unable to see it. Um, and it makes it stronger than if it had just been in a uh, normal image or a, in, a, in a back a regular plain backdrop. And as far as lighting on this, you know, like sometimes I've talked about using lighting as a way to highlight, you know, or accentuate and add a different layer. And, and some images, I don't want lighting to get in the way. So for this, I wanted very simple lighting. So there's a huge uh, um, 
uh, soft lighter as key and then a small uh, soft lighter as fill because I just want it to be soft, slightly directional light that just basically shows her but doesn't distract from the image because there's already so much going on. That was my reason for lighting. And that's one of the things I always, especially I've kind of discovered is uh, through the course of this project, which is thinking about how light, not just how you light, but why you light and what that what effect that has on the image and the emotional response to an image. And sometimes you want it to be, you know, something that is noticeable. And sometimes you want the light to just be out of the way so that it doesn't get in the way of other things. And that was the case with this one. Um, this one was just basically, I had an idea, a paper doll look. And then once I had the paper doll look in my head, I was like, okay, where does that lead me to? And the first thing is like paper dolls, you know, that, you know, era was like the 50s and 60s. So the first thing I thought it was like a 50s housewife was like the perfect thing. And so, you know, the white picket fence, have her in it. And this also, also made the image much, you know, helped me decide how to create the image because putting her on in the backyard, blue sky, green grass, picket fence, cloud, sun, suddenly it's something that I can create with seamless paper. Because once again, I'm, we're in the middle of a pandemic. I'm kind of limited to what I can do and get, you know, basically it's what we had around the house or what we could order quickly from Amazon. So I ordered a piece of colored um, card, uh, cardboard that was designed for like a science project. And my wife, who was way more artistic than I, um, cut out the dress and designed the dress and did this cloud and the stars. She's, I mean, she's amazing um, at that kind of stuff and so many things, but um, that allowed me to basically get to here pretty easily. Um, you might notice that there's three picket fences and there's four here. It ended up three, didn't look like enough. So um, Photoshop was added, but for the most part, the project is very limited Photoshop. That's probably the most Photoshop of anything. And once again, talking about lighting, because I was going for a kind of flat um, paper doll, like I didn't want the lighting to be noticeable. I wanted it to be as minimal as possible. So there's a big soft box or soft lighter behind me for just general light and fill. And then a light very close to the camera, hard to just, you know, kind of give that slight little shadow. Um, and this kind of was a, uh, in the same regards. I had this idea after the January 6th um, insurrection, you know, that attempted coup got me thinking about fictional coups, um, which got me thinking about The Handmaid's Tale. And I was thinking, okay, we should make a handmade image. But once again, going back to my various layers, I did not want to make a picture that had like a costume you could order on Amazon. I didn't want it to look like a Halloween costume or even like the, um, you know, like the people in the show. I wanted it to be different, abstract. And once again, what did we have at home? We had um, seamless paper. And we had also previously on an image um, used uh, paper to make a Christmas image. So we had the red and, you know, my wife and I, I you know, she helped figure out how to do the um, seamless so that we got the bonnet right. and. You know, it was, once again, it's very simple lighting because the image itself is strong enough. I didn't feel like it needed to be any fancy lighting. I wanted it to be very straightforward. So it was just a soft lighter to the right um, coming across the image. And the reason I chose across the white the, from the right for two reasons. I, did, I wanted her face to go slightly into shadow because I didn't want it to be about her. I wanted it to be about the, the starkness of the image. And also having it over here, we get that little bit of a highlight um, on the red seamless uh, on the, basically on the shoulder there. Um, and now I'm gonna skip through a bunch cause I have way more than I need and we're gonna get to more of the technical stuff. Oh, this will um, just to kind of show the, the excitement and you know exciting world of photography. This is one of the images because you know, like I said, we did shot a Valentine's, we and shot a New Year's Eve uh, picture, and you can see here how glamorous it is using luggage to basically hem in the uh, um, the uh, balloons to get the shot. Um, you can also see it's just one hard light very close because we wanted that kind of party pick bright flash. And, you know, she is actually on her knees on pads 
to, so we didn't have to have the um, um, balloons going all the way up to kind of make it as easy as possible on a production side. All right, I'm gonna skip through. I knew I wouldn't get to all of these. Um, so that's wife during quarantine. So one of the things I think, you know, we talked about in the, the explanation of this um, seminar was, you know, not just, you know, creating a, a, a personal project and how, but what do you do with it afterwards? And I'm gonna talk about this in general and also wife during quarantine. So first of all, pitch it. I mean, try to get it. I mean, just because you're doing personal work doesn't mean you can't sell it or get somebody to buy it from you. So many of the personal projects I listed earlier, um, Bushwig, West, um, the Westminster Dog Show, uh, things like that. I, once I was done with it, or even in the middle of it, like Bushwig is a two-day event, and I would shoot day one, and I wouldn't have pitched it before because I was trying new lighting. I didn't know how it was going to work out. I wanted to make sure it was worked out. But then once I had good images, I would reach out to editors that I had worked with who it might be right for and say, hey, I'm shooting Bushwig, here's some images, would you be interested in this? And I've, like I said, I've sold a lot of projects in, uh, that way. So don't think that personal projects just have to be, you know, used personally. You can actually pitch them and, and hopefully get, you know, get them published. The other thing you can do with them is, you know, use them as basically marketing tools. I mean, personal projects, one of the big things is to use it to get more paid work. And so what I try to do on a quarterly basis is send an update email to all the photo editors and stuff, letting them know what I've done, you know, things like that. So this gives you fuel, personal projects give you ammunition for those emails. And you can send those yourself or you can use a provider like MailChimp or Send in Blue to kind of handle the mass mailings of that kind of stuff. Now, where do you get those emails? You can get them at portfolio reviews when you meet with editors or um, you know, producers. Agency access and Yodelist are places where you can buy them. You can do searches on LinkedIn and manually go and find them. You can look at people's Twitter and Instagram's accounts, or you can go to the masthead and website of the, the uh, magazine to build your email list so that you have people to reach out to, to, to market yourself and to pitch and show these images to. Now, I mentioned portfolio reviews. I'm a big fan of them. I, I've, it's, it's been a big part of me developing my career. The big ones that I recommend uh, are NYC Photo Works. They have them in New York and LA, and actually I think Chicago now. The Palm Springs Photo Festival, which they have at in New York, and then obviously in Palm Springs. The Society of Publications and Designers, FSPD, which is here in New York. APA, which has chapters all over the place, has portfolio reviews. And a lot of these and other places will have online portfolio reviews. Now, the other thing that you can do with your personal project is make promos. You know, once again, you need marketing materials to, you know, be a successful photographer. So, the, you know, making a portfolio uh, promo from a personal project is a, is a great thing. And I've done it many times. And for me, I've, you know, there's various uh, vendors out there that I like, MagCloud, Mixum, Modern Postcard, Greener Printer. MagCloud and Mixum are, are, I do for more magazine style. And then Modern Postcard and Greener Printer more for kind of the flyers or one sheet kind of things. And here you can see a promo actually, and please forgive the uh, um, bad iPhone pics of these. So this is a wife during quarantine promo. And then obviously, you know, if you have it for, on your personal project, you, you have, you know, images that you love and feel, you know, strongly about, you should absolutely enter them in contests. But you, I think you need to be, you know, picky about what contests, because there's a lot of contests out there these days. And a lot of them, I think, mostly exist to make money for the contest, as opposed to get you exposed to the right people and awards that actually mean something to most people. These are the awards that I enter on an annual basis or most of these on an annual basis, American Photography, Communication Arts Photo Annual, uh, PDN actually now has gone away, so um, I should remove that. APA has awards, International Photography Awards. Those are the ones that I always enter in. World Press, Sony, P3 are all the ones I don't usually enter, but they're also well-respected, good uh, photography contests. And for, for photo books, there's a couple, and fine art projects, there's a couple kind of specific ones for that, one of which is Critical Mass. 
and the other is which is the Photo Lucida Book Awards. So finally, we're gonna, we're gonna run a little over late. <laughs> at 50 minutes past here, we're getting to the book. And now this is something like the other things I've meant, just mentioned, the contests, the promos, et cetera, I've done in personal projects. I've never done a book before, but Wife During Quarantine was a project that I thought was strong enough and it meant en enough to me for to, to do a book. And so there's three basic ways to get published. There's the major publishers, you know, the Fadens, the Steedles, and, I'm just gonna be honest, I was not going to get published by them. And it, it's very hard. I mean, unless you're a big name photographer, getting published by one of those is, 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 is it's, it's a, you know, it's like winning the lottery. Um, then there's kind of a second tier, which is a lot of the independent book publishers, still very difficult, but more, um, more reasonable. The issue here is even with the independent publishers, the major publishers, you're, they're probably gonna pay for everything. With the independent publishers, you are going to end up paying for everything just as if you were self-publishing. So for me, basically, I decided I wanted to self-publish because I wanted to do it fast. I wanted to be in control of it. And if I was going to have to pay for it anyway, um, I, I, I prefer to just do it that way. Um, so we chose self-publishing. Now, within self-publishing, there's a variety of ways to do it. You can do small run. Um, which, you know, either offset or digital printing, or you can do print on demand. Um, small run is you're buying 200, 300, 500, 1,000, whatever, um, you know, the off or with the digital printing. With the offset printing, you're often having to buy like 5,000, which is obviously a big investment. Um, and then there's print on demand, you know, the blurbs, et cetera. So to finance them, whether it's, you know, you know self-published, the, uh, you know, or even like the independent, there's a, you can self-finance it or you can do Kickstarter. For us, because, you know, I'm gonna go in a second, we chose self-financing because I had the money that it ended up costing. I wanted to, once again, get the book out as soon as possible and not go through the process of a Kickstarter, which would, you know, delay it. But, you know, Kickstarter is a very, you know, well-accepted and often, you know, pursued path of, you know, getting the money for a photo book. So within, Self-publishing, there was three major people that we looked at, Blurb, Bookmobile, which is kind of an offset printer, and Mixum, which is a quasi-on-demand, um, but not really. So what I did is I ordered a whole bunch of samples, <laughs> um, both full-on books and also just test prints. And basically, for, for we decided to go with Mixum for several reasons. First of all, cost. I had Wife During Quarantine is 100 pages and full color, nice quality, thick paper. And on Blurb, that was going to be 100 on using print on demand. For somebody who wanted to buy it, it was going to be $100. Um, that I mean, I wanted something that was available to the masses, so to speak. And not everybody has $100 in the midst of a pandemic to spend on a book. So uh, that, that was one reason we didn't chose Blurb. The other reason is of these three, Mixum was by far the best quality. Um, and so, and not just in my opinion, and everybody I showed it to, I would meet with photographer friends and like them and get opinions and Mixum was the best. Um, so Mixum and Bookmobile, which both allowed you to order like a few hundred at a time, um, were cheaper than Blurb. You know, the books were going to be like, Mixum was going to be $18 a book. Bookmobile was going to be like $22 a book. And that's, you know, my cost, but I could also only buy 200, 300, 500. So, you know, for $5,000 investment, um, I can have a big quantity of books to sell. And if I need more, then order more, um, as opposed to like, if you're doing an offset print and having to do a Kickstarter, often you see people doing like 25,000. So the fact that I, with Mixum, the cost was only going to be around $5,000 is one of the reasons we ended up just self-financing it because it was something reasonable that we could do. So in getting the book, um, you know, having decided on the printer, you got to now decide layout, size, number of images, and sequencing. Um, for number of images, you know, we ended up with 67 Kind of the rule of thumb is you need 40 or 50 images for a book, but once again, it's very personal. So it, it could be way more than that. It could be less than that, it depends on your project. But for us, 
uh, th my goal was once we got to 50 in wife during quarantine, I knew we had a book and we ended up with 67. And then you obviously have to lay out uh, the book. For me, like so many photographers have a subscription to Adobe for uh, um, Lightroom and Photoshop. They also have InDesign. And so what I did is for two months, I just expanded my um, subscription to include InDesign. And that's what I laid the book out in. Now, as far as sequencing, there's pairing and then there's order. So for pairing, you know, it's kind of all by feel. The things I looked at were color, theme, style, and topic. So here it was color, 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 and also a little bit topic because they're, you know, they're both paper, you know, and abstract kind of images. Here it was color and also kind of thematic. They both had to deal with sh shadows, similar framings. Here it was color and also it was a nice mix, the close-up and then the full body. Here, once again, it was color and also kind of the difference between close-up and full body or three quarters. Here it was totally thematic, though the colors do go a little bit, but this was the one on the left is our first vaccination image. The one on the right was the second vaccination. Here it was theme, you know, at 40s um, glamour shot and an 80s glamour shot. Here it was, you know, one is a picture of our dog, second is a picture of a dog, so by theme. Here it was color, obviously, they're both black and white, but it's also theme. The one on the left is kind of a Helmut Newton homage. The one on the right is a Irving Penn homage, so it worked in that regard. But sometimes you also got to know when you don't want to pair, when an image needs to be by itself. So this image, which is probably the, one of the strongest images, probably my most popular image, was by itself. And there, you know, there are other images where I felt like it was just stronger by itself, where you give it room to breathe, or in this case, to scream. And for sequencing, I did two different things. I bought or printed at, um, you know, just cheap prints, four by six of all of the images, laid them out on the floor to kind of get a rough idea. And then I just actually used on my iPad, Adobe Spark or Express, um, and created possible pairings and then just save them into my photos folder on iPad and just rearranged them there. So this is just screenshots of my, you know, photo, my wife during quarantine folder in my photos app on my iPad. And this is the layout of the book, you know, and I could just move them around and play until I got a flow that worked color wise, theme wise. Once again, the flow, I often use the same kind of thought process as I did on the pairing. And then you have your book <laughs> and it's amazing and you're so happy and you, you know, you don't know what to do, but now you got to figure out how you're going to sell it. <laughs> so um, the uh, first choice you have to make is Amazon versus website. I chose website because Amazon, at the volume I'm going to sell at, I'm going to have to pay a dollar per book plus 15%. Whereas if I just sell it on my website, and most people aren't going to be searching for this on my on Amazon anyway, they're going to be people coming from my website, coming from my Instagram, coming from my Facebook. So I thought selling it for free on my website was the best way to do it. And for me, I, I use Format as my um, host for my website, and they have selling, selling built in as the Squarespace. So it was super, super simple. I was worried about how this was going to work, but it was super simple. It was just, you know, setting up it on online and, you know, tying it to my PayPal account my, and, and, and I was good to go. And it handles sending the emails, telling me you know, to, the, to the buyer, telling me that they're sold, um, telling, you know, sending it when I ship it, et cetera. You know, the, the Squarespace and format makes it so easy to do this. Now, one thing you need to know, if, if, if you don't need to do if you're just gonna sell it on your website, but if you have any hope or desire to sell it in an actual bookstore or on Amazon, you're gonna need an ISBN number. Um, and the only one that's licensed to do that in the United States is Boiker, and you're going to need the ISBN and a barcode, um, and that's 125 for the ISBN and 25 for the barcode. barcode. I think it's worth it because it's a one-time fee of $150, and it, it just opens up the whole world of bookstores online and in physical stores for your, for your selling. Um, so now the other question was like, how do you sell it? And for me, even though I didn't do a Kickstarter, I decided to sell it in a way 
that was tiered like mini kick, the Kickstarter. So there was a book, you could order a signed book, and then you could order a signed book with print. So here's basically how it looks on my website. And you can see the pricing there. Cause you know, like I said, like if I was selling it via blurb, it was gonna be, you know, a hundred dollars for a person to buy it. Here I can sell it for eight, you know, $40 and it costs me $18, $20, depending on how many I've purchased from them. So I'm able to make, you know, some profit on the books. And then, you know, you know let's increase price for selling it signed, not just by me, but also by my wife. And then also, and then a higher price for the book signed plus a signed print. Now, this is how it, you know, it looks on the page. You add to cart, it handles it. And then it just take, once they buy, it just takes them to PayPal, link to your, your account, handles all the money and then takes them back to the site and you're all done. Now, selling it yourself means you have to fulfill it yourself. So you have to worry about packaging, shipping. And for me, shipping, there's basically two ways to do it. There's for domestic, USPA media mail, which is the book rate. It's like $4 for anything under two pounds. It's the cheapest, easiest. It gets there fairly quickly. And that's that's just a, a no brainer. And for shipping it internationally, shipping UPS or FedEx is outrageously expensive. So you you for me, just doing all this research, you really wanna do just the uh, USPS first class inter, international service. Um, which depending on the location will be anywhere from 20 to $35. So yes, it's much more expensive for international shipping. But once again, you set that into your sales thing in Squarespace or format and PayPal, and it just handles it automatically, the shipping and handling for you. So, you know, it, it, you don't have to worry about that once you initially set it up. And for me, I just use stamps.com, print them um, just, you know, right here at home, take them to the post office, put them in the the bin and I'm done. And you can see my little setup here. Now, one of the things, as we go on a little bit past time here, um, I didn't know like how to package it. So I did a lot of research and basically I think came up with the best way, which is, you know, you have your book, you have a bubble wrap wrapper, which protects it and also keeps it waterproof. And then you have the cardboard outer that, you know, protects it further and you can put the label on and stuff. And so this is what they look like packed and ready to ship. And then I'm just gonna very quickly go through these because like I said, I did a lot of research to find the best ones that worked. And so these are just the things that worked for me. So if you are interested in them, just go back. And this this is not really about packaging, but these are what I used when I, when certain people would buy a print with it, I would put the print to protect it in this mat and then slide it into the book. The labels, I mean, these are just simple things, stupid things, but you know, like I said, I spent a lot of time going through all of these things to figure out what worked best. So I figured I might as well pass on that knowledge. And even as something as stupid as what pen to sign the books with, I actually went to um, Blick and tried a bunch of pens. I had asked on New York Image Makers Facebook group, you know, what do people recommended? Sharpies, whatever. People recommended a whole lot of things. And I went and tried them all and this is the best, <laughs> at least with the paper that uh, um, makes some prints on. Obviously, you should test on your book. Um, and then the final thing, just to wrap up here, and I know we're a little bit over time, um, what you can do with your project is do a show. Um, this is something I'm working on right now with Wife During Quarantine. And obviously, if you can get a gallery involved, that's wonderful and um, perfect, but obviously not everybody has galleries where they are. And obviously it's very tough to get into galleries that do exist. So that may not work. But the other thing you could do is just do a pop-up at a rented or a vacant space, or just do a show at your home or a friend's home who might have a lot of wall space, you know, do a, you know, a book release party slash show. And, you know, obviously prints can be extremely expensive. So I'm going to pass on a little tip that I used uh, or discovered, which is if you're going to do like kind of just a little pop-up show, go to bigposters.com. And I, once again, I'm not affiliated with this. This is just something I've used. Um, you can get a 24 inch by 32 inch print on one quarter foam board for $20. So if I was going to do a show of, you know, 15 of uh, Wife During Quarantine for $300, I could get plus shipping, I could get 24 by 32 prints, huge, already mounted on foam board, just to easily put up on the wall and, and have a show. Um, and 
I've had, the, once again, excuse the crappy phone pick, but I printed two of the more difficult images, the one with the chair because of the fine gradations of shadow. And obviously it's not showing well on this picture, um, but it handled that extremely well. I mean, I use a lot of Adorama picks or what is it called now, Printique for my uh, uh, work prints. And these prints came out as good as anything I've got from Printink, and they're just so cheap, plus on a backdrop, that it is, in my opinion, if you want to do a pop-up show on the cheap, this is what you should do. Um, and I would be rem remiss if <laughs> I didn't do a, uh, you know, a marketing slide, you know, saying where you can actually buy the book since we've been talking about the book. Um, and that is it. And I know I've gone long, and I apologize, Derek, but... Um, let me stop share. No, wow, we love it. That was like the comprehensive guide to everything. Now, if, if we could just learn to take pictures like you, I think we'd be good. <laughs> 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 no, that really was a ton of information. We do have some, some questions in. One being, what was there a single piece or a single component that you feel made that series blow up and become so successful to the point of wanted, wanting to do a book? So was it something, was it you know, gaining traction just via Instagram, or was it a particular uh, publication that picked up the the project? Um, yeah, it, well, you know, initially I thought, well, I'm going to have a great promo out of this, and then as the Instagram responses and reactions to the image images started rolling in, and I started doing more and more, where you know it wasn't just ten or twenty images; we were getting up to thirty you know, I started thinking, you know, this is a book. And I had people on Instagram saying, oh my God, you need to do a book of this. But I would say it was the handmade image that kind of, and is like the signature image from uh, the series. A, because of, you know, obviously that was a big political moment and, you know, it, it, it touched or reached a lot of people in that regard. And I think it's a very strong image. And it just, I mean, it's, by far my most liked image. And it's also the image I've gotten the most recognition from. I mean, it was selected for American photography. It was selected for the communication arts photo annual, and it was selected for best in show for that. Um, it was got third place in the fine portrait category or the fine art portrait category of the international photography awards. It won an award from APA. Um, so that image was, I guess the image that, you know, it's kind of the premier or distinctive images from it, but you know some of the other images also had have won awards, and so it was just, you know, I think it was just, I think people loved the creativity of the project and just the nature of the project, which was just me and my wife doing everything by ourselves. And I got a, you know, the big shout out to my wife who was absolutely amazing in this. A being willing to be photographed this many times, looking good and looking with a face mask, you know, or, a, you know, like a, you know, a gel mask on and all the various things I asked her to do and being willing and excited. And she's never modeled. She's never acted. She actually kind of hates having her picture taken, but did a, a, a magnificent job. And also she did all of the hair and makeup herself um, wow. and helped tremendously on styling and production design. So it really was a joint project. And I think people really responded to that. You know, people were sitting at home, you know, twiddling their thumbs and doom scrolling. So see these bright, fun images in a lot of, you know, not all of them, but a lot of them are bright, fun images. And I think it, people just responded to that. And it, it, it kind of, kind of started, you know, snowballing and mushrooming from there. Mm -hmm. I, I love how you, and you, you mentioned it, how you try to do something different every time. And I think, that's what was so impressive to me in seeing this project unfold is it most people it's like they can't pull they don't have enough juice in the creative tank to go to that in that many different directions and you executed it so well on every single image it was like you know we got to the point where I, I know I was and I'm sure a lot of other people were looking forward to seeing what is Chris going to do next is he going to one up himself? Like, where does it kind of go? And, and, you know, with that last question, I was thinking the same thing with the, the Handmaid's Tale image. I think that's where a lot of people, because of the relevance to everything that we were going on and it, all the political, the, the political um, undertones, 
behind that whole thing. And I think it was just like right time, right place, right circumstances for an image like that. Now, was it all creatively you? Was your wife, you know, did she give her input on stuff or who was, you know, was it really a, a back and forth? I would say that I was the driving force and then my wife would either just, you know, um, give like, you know, obviously hair and makeup. I'm like, you know, like I need, uh, you know, I'm going to do, I want an updo. And she's like, well, I can do like a beehive or, you know, so I would have the general idea. And then I would say, Hey, here's what I'm thinking. Can you do this? Or, okay. Or I'm thinking of this. What would you, why, how, what, what do you think would be the appropriate styling for it? So some of the times it was just like, Hey, stand here, you know, put this on. You know, but most of the time it was me coming up with an idea and then we're collaborating on hairs, makeup, styling, and then even production design on, you know, we're I'm bouncing things off her. She's giving ideas um to kind of complete the image. Mm -hmm. And so how it was did... go, yeah, ahead. go ahead. You know, so it was very much, you know, you know. A, a a joint venture. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. And how long did the average shoot take for this? Um, I would say most were like ten or fifteen minutes. I mean, that from like oh, from her perspective. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, so I would have everything because you know she is a corporate executive. She is working, uh, you know, a nine to five, which actually is more like an eight to nine or whatever. That's even more She's impressive. At crazy hours of of work, you know, especially during the pandemic, where you know there were no boundaries. So I tried to get everything as basically set up as possible. And, you know, I would tell her, okay, we're going to shoot this, you know, image tomorrow. And so she would kind of prepare like her makeup and hair for work would be such that it would be easy for her to, you know, translate that to the, what was going to be needed in the shot. Or she would wear something that, you know, would be easily to, you know, change out of, or something that would, you know, she would wear something that we would actually use in the shot. Um, so her time in front of the camera would be, you, you know, usually fairly short, the production or time on my end to make sure it was as efficient as possible would be longer than that. So that, you know, which is also kind of the way you work on a editorial shoot on assignment, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, when I'm shooting a celebrity or anybody for an editorial shoot, you know, I'm trying, I get there early and I set up my lighting and I test and I do all these things so that the person only has to come in and sit there for, you know, the 10 minutes or however long I have them without doing much, because I can never guarantee how long I'm going to have them, especially with a celebrity. They can mm -hmm. tell you, I'm going to give you a half hour and then five minutes, 10 minutes in, I'm out of here. So you've got to be very efficient with their time. So I tried to do the same with Maggie um, in the fact that I tried to make it as easy as her for her as possible um, so that, you know, it'd be an efficient use of her time. But obviously, as you saw, a lot of these were pretty involved on her part too with oh, yeah. um, hair, makeup, costuming, you know, the scenario, you know, the, you know, we didn't show the one out in the field in the snow in the wedding dress, but you know, there's, there was images that were fairly involved even for her <laughs> and she was a trooper. That's awesome. I don't, I don't think I can say the same. I don't think my wife would have sat that patiently <laughs> for that whole series, but uh huge, huge, huge props to your wife on all of that. Now, were you stockpiling images or, or ideas or was this like, was it just kind of like when, when something, when an idea struck you or was it like, Hey, after a couple images, you're just running with it and you start brainstorming. It was amazing. Cause it, I would definitely go through streaks, you know, where you're just in a creative zone where like literally every day you're having a new idea. But then once again, I kind of had the realities of my wife's schedule. So it was hard to do more than like two or three images a week, given my wife's schedule. Um, like over the Christmas holidays, we ended up in that like five day period that she had off over Christmas, like, you know, five images. We were doing one a day because, you know, like I said, I, I keep a list of ideas. And so I would have all these ideas kind of I'm starting to prep. And when you get in that, those juices flowing, like create one, one thing I kind of discovered is creative creativity feeds creativity. Um, and making work makes you better at it because you start thinking and your juices are flowing and things, you know, you see something like, Oh, that's an image. And, you know, so I would have, I wouldn't say I was stockpiling them because we, I tried to shoot them as efficiently and quickly as we could but there, I was always trying to, you know, keep it going. And there were definitely times when, 
you know, we were shooting very often, but there were also times during the course of it where it would be like a month between shots because, you know, my wife was extremely busy or things. And, you know, my dad through the course of the pandemic got very ill and ended up dying. So things like that um, happened. And so there were times when there was lulls, but for the, you know, we ended up doing, I guess, like basically an image a week. Um, and sometimes that was two or three images a week. Sometimes it was once a month, <laughs> but it averaged out to about an image a week. Wow. So has this kind of kicked you in the butt where you're like, you know, Okay. And you, have you have the itch for doing more books now? Well, that's one thing is, you know, through the course of this, I discovered, I mean, you know, how, not how easy, because it is a lot of work, but that it, you know, I had always had this image of, you know, through the Kickstarters and offset printing, like, oh, it's $25,000 to do a book. But, you know, now with, you know, mix them and knowing how they print and the various sizes, you know, I can almost do books like, you know, like a zine almost, you know what I mean? Like a lot of people print a lot of zines and stuff, but, you know, you can do these small little runs where for, you know, a few thousand dollars, you can print 200 books and, you know, sell them, you know, you know, and, and to like you know, collectors and or fans and friends and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I want to continue to obviously shoot my wife, photograph my wife um, <laughs> and, you know, keeping creating uh new work with her, but also take the skills and creativity and kind of the artistic bent that I kind of discovered within myself through this project and apply it to my assigned work as well. And also, you know, one of the things I'm kind of starting now, both um, shooting my wife and with other people is now that the, you know, pandemic is kind of over, is doing a life after quarantine series, where I'm shooting, you know, still pictures of my wife, but doing pictures of friends and other people that I couldn't shoot or didn't shoot during, you know, celebrities or whoever I have a relationship with during the course of the pandemic and doing fine art portraits of them as a new series and hopeful book. That's awesome. Well, the, the project was incredibly inspiring for, for everyone else. And I, I will tell everyone that we did drop the link to Chris's book in the, the comment section there for everybody who's joining us across the reaches of the internet. So definitely go check that out and, and you can purchase it there. But Chris, I think the, the best way to describe this last hour and 15 minutes was Rodney, not a question, but a comment. This was the best event. Rodney, I agree. This was, <laughs> this was awesome. I mean, it was, it was entertaining. The work was great, but you broke it down. You did the work. I, I know I'm sitting here and I'm like, I stopped taking screen grabs. I'm like, I'm just going to go back. I'm going to bookmark it. You, Chris did the work. We're going to go back in. And I think this is like a nice comprehensive look at what it takes to take an idea and formulate it, can, you know, execute it and really take it to another level. And I think, uh, you know, books, they've always been around, but we, it's like you just said, you haven't always seen it as, as attainable as it is now. And I think everybody thought pretty much the same thing. They always, I'd always heard of a book as being the most expensive business card. And yeah. I, I think that that idea is kind of changing. It's good for everybody out there who's creating. And I think there's just something different about holding a book in your hands that's even different than a print. It's, you know, it's it's a collection of images. It's really someone's heart and soul poured into it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, here's the book. And I got to tell you, it, you're right. I mean, what, I mean, I'm just incredibly proud of, a, of the work. But I mean, just, I, the fact that I have a book, which I never would have, you know, contemplated or, you know, March of 2020, before this all started, um, is just, just amazing to me. And, you know, obviously the pandemic has been an awful thing, but I am happy to have at least this one positive thing out of it. That is awesome. Well, Chris, we wish you the best of success on that and going forward. And, and I implore everyone, go out there, support the artists. It's it's great to have these these books. And I can say from my photo book collection, I'll be adding, adding that to my collection as well. Oh, we turned our video off there. I got so excited over here. I shut my video off. Wow. Um, but no, it, it's always great to just, it's the easiest thing to do is to just open up a book of, of somebody's work that inspires you. So Chris, I want to thank you for not only sharing your time, but sharing a little extra. We got a little extra bonus 20 minutes there. From yeah, you, so. I'm sorry about going over. <laughs> no, no, look, I, I'd have you on. If it were up to me, I'd have you on for another hour. We'd be, we'd be digging in. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I look to be look to have you back uh, in the future. And of course, you know, if there's any any ever projects you want to jump back on and, and talk about, we'd love to have you back. We always love having you on, Chris. Thank you so much. I love the opportunity and appreciate it.
Awesome. Well, thank you again. And uh, thank you to all of our viewers out there who joined us for this special yeah. presentation. Again, we dropped the link in there for you guys. And we will have this archived online for those of you who can take notes fast enough. But alas, this is our last webinar for a while. We're going on a little bit of a break. So we will catch up with you in a couple of weeks here on the BNH virtual event space. But that's all we got for now. We'll catch you all next time.